Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Layson, part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church. And I want to say how great it is that you've joined us for our online prayer book service today. Um, this is our last prayer book service where we have to, where we have to all be online. Uh, our services will be continuing uh, online for those of you who aren't able to make it in person. But next week, we will be able to be back back in the flesh. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, today, we're going to be continuing our series looking at uh, the, the greatness of Jesus. And particularly today, focusing on the fact that, uh, that he not only is God and in control of all things, as we saw last week, uh, but he's also became one of us and how significant and important that is. But uh, let's start off our service by singing a great old hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, which talks about the fact that God himself uh, is cleft, is broken for us as Christ dies on the cross for us. So let's sing this great song of joy together. If you have an Australian prayer book, you might like to turn to page 45. We'll be following the, the service for Sunday morning, which you'll find on page 45 of the prayer books. We start off our service reading from Psalm 118. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice 
and be glad in it. Will you join with me as we say together Psalm 95? O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, put me to proof that they had seen my works, of whom I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. That psalm speaks of the glory, how glorious God is. And when we're confronted with God's glory, we recognise our own sinfulness, our own frailty. And so will you join with me as we begin our service by praying this prayer of confession together. You'll find it on page 44. So just turn back one page to page 44 together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Have mercy on us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you and live a new life to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the perfect offering for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. God doesn't abandon us despite our sinfulness. In fact, he invites us to come near to him. He wants to speak with us. So we're going to hear from God's word in a moment. But before we do, let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your holy word. And for the fellowship of your church, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory and the salvation of our fellow men and women. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm going to hand over to Shirley and to Cecily, who are going to read from God's word for us. The reading is from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the Lord's word to us. Good morning. Our Bible reading is from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 18. Jesus made fully man. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is a man that you are mindful of them? a son of man, that you care for, for him. You made him a them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honour and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under, their f under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, 
We do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, and the children of and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in the humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who are, who are all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully man in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the end of the lesson. Well, before we look further at those passages, uh, will you join with me as we encourage each other and remind each other of the fact that we are united with each other, uh, despite the fact that we can't actually be together phys physically just yet, um, but we are united with all Christians across the world and throughout the ages. And so these are the things that bind us. Let's say together the Apostles' Creed. You'll find it on page 47. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descends into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, let's look further at what God has to say to us. Well, I wonder if you've ever felt dwarfed by someone else's ability. Some of you will know over the years I've played a little bit of football in my life, uh, but when I compare myself to people like uh, Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo or Pelé, people like that, the things, I look at the things they can do with the ball at their feet. It's just, I, I just can't understand how they do that. Uh, it's just incredible. It makes me feel so small. Um, I also play a bit of guitar. Uh, but again, when I compare myself to you know, people like Mark Knopfler or Tommy Emmanuel or some of the great guitarists, uh, again, I, I love the way they can just make the, the, the instruments sing and it just seems so effortless for them. Um, and then, of course, there's art. Well, my stick figures don't even really look like sticks. And so when I compare myself to people like Da Vinci or Van Gogh, or, you know, I don't even deserve to be in the same room as them. And don't even get, get me started about the surfers you see down at South Wherry. I, like, I just, how do they do that? What about you? I wonder if there are things that you kind of look at in your life that you do and you think, well, why can't I be like these, these other people? Maybe it's to do with singing uh, or dancing or painting or flower arranging or maybe something to do with your job or, or parenting. You look at these other people and you compare, compare yourself to these superstars 
And you can feel ashamed. You can feel uh, how, how my meagre attempts are just completely not even worth trying. Well, there is a danger of feeling that way when we come to church. Not from looking at people like me. I mean, that's probably, I'm probably going to make you feel better. At least I'm not like that. Um, but when you compare yourself to Jesus, you may remember last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 1 and we saw that Jesus was the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the exact representation of God. He sits at God's right hand in heaven. He has authority over all things that happen and over all people. He's greater even than the angels, which is why, of course, this series is called The Greatness of Jesus. Now, when you think about how amazing, how great Jesus is, one response might be to think, well, if Jesus is so incredible, so majestic, why would he have anything to do with someone like me? I mean, when I compare myself to him, I'm so insignificant. We've been reminded how big and amazing Jesus is, And so it can make us feel small and insignificant. But before we get carried away too much with that feeling, um, the writer of the Hebrews has something really important he wants to tell us in in chapter 2, verses 5 to 18. So let's have a quick look at what he has to say to us. You may remember in chapter 1, he talked about a fair bit about the angels. Well, he had a little bit of a side note at the the first four verses of chapter 2, as we saw last week. But now he comes back to it. He says, now that I mention angels, I want you to know that God's kingdom was not set up for them. Great as they are, uh, God had other people in mind. And so he quotes Psalm 8 uh, in in verses uh, 6 and 7. He he goes back to the Psalms. To the Psalms, I love the way he does it. Uh, for like people like you and me who uh, who always forget, you know, there are some people who know where every passage just comes from the Bible, just like that. Well, uh, the writer of the Hebrews goes, "Oh, somewhere, someone said. I can't remember what it was." Uh, anyway, he he looks back to Psalm Psalm eight, and he express that Psalm expresses this very feeling. It starts off um, when I consider the works of your hands, all the things that you have made, God. It's so incredible. And then, as as he quotes in verse six. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honour and put everything under their feet. What, who are we, God, that you would have anything to do with us? Why would you care? Well, amazingly, when God made the world, he created it for us. He created us, created, created it, and created humans as the pinnacle of that creation to rule over the, over the world. That's part of what it means to be in God's image. Just as God rules, uh, so he has given us that position of, of authority in our world. That's why we're, in some ways, crowned with glory and honour. We have great privilege in our world. He created it, but he has given us authority over it. And you can kind of see that in our world, can't you? It's, it's human beings who make decisions about, uh, about how, what, where, how far the animals will go, this far and no further, um, it's, it's human beings who do, who've domesticated the animals. Um, it's us who have pets, not the other way around, unless you've got a cat, I guess. Um, God has made the world subject to humanity. But, of course, we don't always do very well at that, do we? In fact, because of our sin and our, and our failure to do things God's way, our world is now out of control. And that's why he says um, we don't see th- things like this. At present, we do not see everything subject to them. We don't see everything subject to humans because our world is now broken. Um, There are plenty of things in this world that are out of our control. In fact, in some ways, it seems like the world is out of control. But although we see that, we look at our world and we see the pain and the suffering and the the climate change, we see the, the, the way things are changing and not necessarily for the good. Although we see these things, they're not the only things we see, he says. In verse 9, we see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour. Just think about that for a moment. We see Jesus, who is made lower than the angels. If you remember back to chapter 1 last week, you remember that we've heard how how Jesus is greater than the angels. In fact, he went to great lengths, didn't he, to show how Jesus is greater than them. He's the radiance of God's glory. So much greater than the angels, but now he's been made lower than the angels. In fact, as we're going to see in a moment, he even tasted death. The very thing that the eternal Lord of the universe, the giver of life, could never experience. 
but far from diminishing him, far from making him uh, worth of, of lower worth, Jesus' death and Jesus being made lower than the angels actually makes him more glorious and incredible. Let me read to you verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lot, made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might, might taste death for everyone. Jesus didn't uh, experience death uh, as some kind of heavenly red balloon experience to see what it, what it was like for people to go through. No, he did it for us. Later on in the chapter, uh, from verses 14 to, seven, to 18, he's going to explain a little bit what that means. But in verse 17, he says, For this reason, he made, had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might be, become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Now we're going to be thinking a lot about what it means for Jesus to be the high priest in the coming weeks, and so I, I don't want to get into that too much. But I, don't want you, I want you to consider people in, pro, in, tr, in trouble. If there's somebody who's trapped in a burning building, who do you send in to save them? Of course, you don't send somebody dressed in their speedos into a burning building to rescue someone. If somebody is drowning in the surf down here at Werry, uh, you don't, again, you don't, send, you don't send a firefighter dressed in all of their heavy gear and all those kind of things to, in to rescue them. The type of rescue def defines the type of rescuer that you need. Well, for us to be rescued from sin, Jesus needs to be made like us. He needs to be made human in order to rescue humans. You see, when God rescues us and gives us eternal life, he doesn't sit there, sit there in heaven beckoning people and say, come, come and join me. No, he actually comes down to us and says, let me lift you up so that you might be where I am. This, of course, is why he's now crowned with glory and honour. He's worthy of worship, not just because he's the creator and sustainer of all things, the exact representation of God. That's, that's, he's worthy of worship for that, of course. But now, because of his death, he has set us free. He's not just the perfect creator, he's also now the perfect saviour because of what he's gone through. Because of his death, uh, Christ is now lifted up even higher even though for a short amount of time he was lowered down. In fact, um, that quote from this, when he quotes verses 6 to 8, uh, in some translations, uh, it's, it's, it's tweaked just a little bit. So he's actually referring to Jesus, not just uh, referring to humans. He just tweaks it a little bit. Uh, whether or not that's the case, Jesus certainly has become one of us. He's become one with us so that he might lift us up. And now, of course, because of what Christ has done, everything has changed for us. And so I just want to think of four things that this passage talks about that have changed for us. Four things that uh, the writer highlights here that I think make a huge difference for each, each one of us. And the first one is there in verse 10. He has brought us to glory. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Christ died and rose to life and now sits at God's right hand in glory and he brings us to be in glory with him. In a, in a very real sense, you and I are already seated in God, at God's right hand. Jesus came to establish his kingdom on earth. By his death and his resurrection, that kingdom has been established. God's kingdom is now here on earth. And as we put our hope and our trust in him and accept him as our own Lord, he becomes, we become part of that kingdom here and now. And one of our roles as Christians is to live out that glory. We now seated with God in heaven. Uh, we are in his presence and nothing can take us away from him. And so now... Because we are with living in, in glory with God, we can now live out that glory. We are to shine that glory. I guess that's why Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. But then he also says to his disciples, to his followers, that you are the light of the world. We have received glory from God so that we might shine glory from God. We are to live out the, the lordship of Christ in our lives. You have been changed 
changed into glory. And so the question, one of the questions we must ask ourselves in the light of that is, are we living out that glory? Do we shine that glory? A few weeks ago, we, we saw in the book of Exodus how Moses went up into God's presence uh, and when he came down, his face shone and he actually hid his face because people were too afraid to see it. But God doesn't want us to hide our face, to hide our light. We don't put a light under a bucket. He wants us to shine our light in the world, to shine at the glory of God, to live out our submission to our king, that others may see it and come to him. But of course, we're not just slaves in the kingdom of some despotic king. And we have something even greater than that in the very next verse, in verse 11. Verse, both the one who made people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Hear that? Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. What we've received from God is an invitation to, to join the royal family. And not the royal family of the Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but the king of the whole universe. Remember how Jesus was described last, described last week? The creator and sustainer of all things, the, uh, the exact representation of God's glory. Well, we are invited to share in that. And it's not as if he begrudgingly allows us to sneak into heaven through the tradesman's entrance. Uh, no, he's not ashamed of us to call us brothers and sisters. He's proud to call us his family. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Sadly, many Christians and many people in our society suffer from low self-esteem and low estimations of their worth. I think social media, media plays into that a lot. Uh, partly by making us compare ourselves to the best parts of everyone else, or at least their portrayal of the best parts. It's like me at the beginning of this talk. I'm comparing myself to all those people who are better than me. And so often we do that, don't we? We, we look at others and say, why can't I be like, be, be like them? I'm nowhere near as good as them. And we can feel uh, very down on ourselves. Well, if that's you, just ponder this truth for a moment. You are part of God's family. You might like to try saying, Jesus is proud to call me his brother or his sister. To say, I am part of the royal family. That's who I am. You are so valuable to him that he was prepared to give his own son to bring you into that relationship. He invites you to join with Christ as we celebrate with God forever. You are of immense value to God, and so you are of immense value. Don't ever let social media or people's opinions of you take that away. You are precious to God, valuable to him, and you always will be. But perhaps the most important thing that Christ does for us, yes, he brings us into glory with God, yes, he brings us into the family, but probably most importantly for us, he has also defeated death for us. In verse 14 and 15, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus had to die because he had to rise again. He had to defeat the one who had the power over death. By dying and rising to life, um, Jesus has shown that death is not the end for us. Paul describes him as the first fruits of those who will also rise from the dead. He is the first of many. Of course, he does that by, by taking our He makes that possible by taking our sin, paying for the penalty for our sin, so that we, can, we don't have to fear what death will bring anymore. Sadly, there are so many people who do, do live in that fear of death. They may not express it that way. Uh, in, fact, in fact, in our culture, we've pushed death to the side so much that we don't even like to talk about so, as someone as dying. We talk about them as passing away or moving to a better place. Uh, we don't ever talk about people dying. We like to push it aside. And so, so quite often nowadays, funerals uh, don't even have the, uh, have the coffin in, in the... Uh, in, either in the church or uh, in the crematorium, uh, sometimes it's not even there. They just have a, a wake. 
where they celebrate what's been. And so death is kind of pushed to the side. And so many of us in our culture um, fill our lives with so many things that we don't have time to stop and think about death. Uh, we we uh, fill our lives with so much busyness, don't we? And we push all these thoughts. And when we do start to feel, think, think about these, uh, these more heavy kind of things, well, we, well, so many people like to dull the pain, with, perhaps with alcohol, or with drugs or, or with other things. Uh, there are some who are so afraid of death that they, they focus their life on fulfilling their bucket list. They have all these things that they want to do. And they, they chase after those things so that they can put off thinking about it or dealing with the fact that they will die one day. But of course, we can't get escape, can we? The, the only uh, certainty in life, really, is that we will all die. But of course, by Christ's death and resurrection, we are now free from that fear of death. But we know that it's not the end for us. We can approach our own coming death with confidence and even joy, knowing that there is something better in store for us. As, as Paul writes in Philippians 1, for us to die is gain. And that's actually something I have the privilege to see over and over again as I, as I spend time with, with, with saints who are, about to, uh, who are about to die, both here and elsewhere. And I see in them this great joy and, and contentment, not a fear, but a knowledge that, that they are going to be with God and that their future is actually a positive thing. That kind of hope is so inspiring, it's so encouraging. And this is exactly where it comes from. Knowing that Christ has actually made it possible, he's taken away the power of death over us and so longer, no, we no longer have to be afraid. So Christ, through his coming, becoming a man and living and dying, uh, has brought us to glory, he's brought us into his family uh, and he has also made it possible for us to know that life can go on be beyond our death, that we can have hope for the future. But because of that, he's also, we're told in verse 18, he's also been there and done that, he's also able to help those who are going through hard times. In verse 18, because he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being temp tempted. When you start out in a career, one of the best people to, to talk to about what to expect are people who have been there. Maybe those who are coming to the end of their career, who have, who have been through and they can share with you some of their tips and their pointers that you might need to survive. Well, the writer is not trying to con us to think that you know, believing in life now and being in glory in God's family means that everything's going to be perfect for us. It's going to be like living in Garden of Eden again and we'll never have any trials or problems. Uh, of course difficulties will come our way. The people he's writing to are under persecution and we too will experience those kinds of things. But here again, we have an ally in Jesus. Jesus has walked in our shoes. He's felt the temptation to give up that we feel. He's felt the temptation to take the easier road. When we, feel, when we struggle, uh, we can turn to a brother who walks alongside us on the road. He is always there with us and for us. We never need to feel alone or abandoned. He can and he will give us the strength we need to resist temptation, to save us from giving up on our Christian walk. There's a lot of dense theology in this book, as, we, as we'll see in the coming weeks. But it wasn't written, or rather given as a sermon, um, delivered as a theological treatise for us to study and pull apart. It had a very practical aim in mind. He wants to encourage the listeners uh, and, and the readers. To you, he wants to encourage you and me um, that, to help us in the face of, of difficulties in life, and particularly in persecution. Last week, we, saw, we had a powerful reminder of the majesty of Jesus. How we don't um, follow an insipid, weak, uh, hopeless God. Uh, we, have what, we follow somebody who is the, is the Lord of all, who has authority over all things, over all people and over, over all events. But what's even more incredible than that? We don't just have a God who sits up there in heaven in power and glory and majesty looking down at us, weak, insignificant beings. No, he became one of us. And in so doing, he has brought us into the glory of God's kingdom. He's invited us and welcomed us with open arms into God's family. He has saved us from slavery to sin and death 
by giving us forgiveness and atonement for our sins, making us right with God. And he has promised to be with us, to guide us, to strengthen and to comfort us. So hold on to this picture. Let it strengthen your faith as, as you reflect on the value God places on you, as you reflect on the position of privilege and honour he has given to you, as you walk day by day in the company of this one uh, who has been there and done that for us. But also let it inspire you. Let it inspire you not to just to, to soak in the, the blessings, but to share out the blessings with others, to live out that glory. Let the glory of God shine through you. Let the love of God of, the welcome into your family. Let that sh- flow out in your love uh, and welcome to others. As you are comforted in your fear, comfort others and walk alongside those who are in need. Let's take this passage and take it to heart so that it might build us up, but all that, also let it embolden us and strengthen us to serve and to live out this life uh, for God and for his glory. Let me pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you because you are not just the Lord of the universe, but you are the perfect saviour. By, by making yourself lower than the angels, by allowing yourself to go to death, you are You established the perfect salvation for us. You've now welcomed us into the glory of your kingdom. You've kindly uh, wrapped your arms around us as your brothers and sisters. You've promised that you will be with us as we walk along the road and you have set us free from the fear of death. Lord, may these things encourage us. Help us to hold on for those who are struggling, for those who are tempted to give up on their walk with you. But for each one of us too, we pray, Lord, that it might inspire us, that it might excite us to not just to welcome these things for ourselves, but to share them with others. And we pray for us us as individuals and as a church that we might shine out your glory to this world so that your name would be given the honour it deserves. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in response to what we've heard from God's word, let us now move into a time of prayer together. We're going to be on page 48. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The collect for today, the 25th Ordinary Sunday. Father, guide us as you guide creation according to your law of love. May we love one another and come to perfection in the eternal life prepared for us. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. And the colic for the morning. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, Lorraine Sampson from the Evening Service is now going to lead us in prayer. Hello, everybody. I have the privilege of praying for everyone today. So let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have given us this beautiful world that we live in. I thank you that you have given us the responsibility and the ability to look after the environment and all the people uh, that we mix with all the beautiful flora and fauna. Thank you for creating these for our for us. Lord, I pray for the world leaders who are going to Glasgow. I pray that you will help them make wise decisions that will help look after our world. And Lord, I pray for the people in our world. I pray that uh, out of the COVID pandemic that we have, that, that good will come from this and that your will will be done. Lord, I pray for... Um, protection in Australia for the people in our, our area, in the Kaima local government area, the Shoalhaven and the Wollongong areas. 
Please help us, Lord, and please help us to be kind and caring and to look after each other. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join with me in the grace? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, can I thank you for joining us for our online service today? Um, and just a few qu quick announcements to, uh, to let you know about what's happening in the coming weeks. Uh, next week, of course, we're allowed to come back to, to live services, um, which is fantastic. And so for those of you who are coming back, or even indeed if you're not coming back, um, we, it's, uh, we're going to have a particular focus of Thanksgiving next Sunday. And so one of the things we'd like, if you, if you are able to, during the week, um, take a, uh, a video of yourself giving, just saying something that you are thankful for. Perhaps it's something that you've learned through COVID, or perhaps you're, you're thankful that COVID is coming, we're, we're coming out of COVID restrictions. Or it might be something completely different um, that you, you are thankful to God for. Uh, if you could film it uh, on your phone um, or on your, on your, on your computer, um, if, you could, if you're doing it on your phone, please fill it with a, a landscape like this rather than having it up like this. That will make it easier for, for, the, uh, for editing purposes. If you could send that to me by Thursday this week, um, I'd love to have a compilation of some of the things that people are thankful for. But next week when we do come back to, to Church Live, just to let you know, um, we will be limited to the number of people that are able to come. Obviously, if you are feeling unwell or have any symptoms, we'd ask you not to come. Um, but otherwise, uh, people are able to come. We're able to, we will be a distance at four, one person per four square metres, and so we will we'll be endeavouring to have an overflow into the hall if we, if we have more than 20 people in the church. Um, obviously, as we come in, we'll, people will need to sign in, as usual, um, use the hand sanitizer that's available, uh, and be wearing masks during the service. Unfortunately, as a congregation, we won't be able to sing next week, but we will be able to have songs sung for us. Uh, and so we have in the past had an impromptu choir up the front, and so we'll be doing that again next, next Sunday. The other thing that we'd like to do next Sunday, if it's at all possible, is to have a, a, lunch, a luncheon after the 10 o'clock service. And so if you're able to join us uh, for our service, we invite you to, to bring your own uh, picnic lunch to come and join us on the grounds uh, here, here at the church, just as a way of getting to know each other, getting back connected with each other, uh, and just seeing each other face to face. I think it would be a lovely way for us to, to, I guess, celebrate the fact that we're able to be back together. So I hope you're able to join us for that. Bring your own lunch, uh, bring a chair to sit on, uh, and come and join us at about 11.45 next Sunday morning. Uh, for those of you who aren't able to come and join us or aren't able to be at the services live, then don't be afraid. Um, services will continue. Our online services will continue uh, from next week. So uh, you'll still be able to connect with our services in the same way. We've heard today about how Christ gave up all the glory of heaven and became a human, how incredible that is, how important that is for each one of us. He showed us the way. He came and lived as a servant amongst us. And so as he does that, he gives a model for us as we live our lives for him. And so let's finish off our service by singing a song that reminds us of those truths uh, it's a song that's written about the 80s uh, by Graham Kendrick. It's called The Servant King. So thank you for joining us. Uh, let's finish off by singing together. <laughs> 